say a few words about this piece. It's, uh, it's a big piece, and I, I promise not to talk too long, but I, I think it's deserving of a, a little bit of an explanation. Uh, as Thomas said, it was kind of written in fits and starts during the, the depths of the pandemic, actually begun before and kind of picked up and put down many times. Uh, and completed in a version uh, afterwards and kind of recorded in piecemeal fashion and, and put together. Uh, but it's been, it's been really exhilarating actually to see these three uh, musicians take on this piece. They've uh, told me that they enjoy performing it enough times that I, I actually believe them. Uh, and uh, again, for me, it really is very, very exciting to kind of see it all come to life. Uh, the Horn Trio is kind of one of the lesser known configurations in the chamber music world. It's only a thing because uh, Johannes Brahms had a friend who was a horn player and uh, commissioned uh, a work for this configuration. It was picked up again a little bit in the 20th century and a uh, composer who I'm quite fond of, who I was inter introduced to very early on in my career, uh, Legety, uh, wrote quite a substantial work for a uh, horn trio. And I've, I've always felt a kinship with him for many reasons, really. He's uh, someone who is, I've always thought of as a composer who writes for instrumentalists, but really has the sensibilities of, a, of an electronic musician, and that's, that's something that I definitely identify with that I, I think will come across here. He's also someone who was interested in kind of broken machines, and I, I think the Horn Trio in a way is kind of just that. It's, it's a group that's hard, hard to work with. It doesn't want to balance. There's, there's awkward things that happen, and, I, and those are the kind of things that I like. I said, oh, that's, that's for me. Let's see if we can make it work or expose the ways in which it doesn't work. Uh, and that's kind of the tack that I take. There, there's music here and the performers picked up on it instantly that asked them to be incredibly kind of uh, emotional, sensitive human beings. But on the other hand, then asked them to almost instantaneously switch hats and, and play in a, a really robotic, mechanical kind of um, yeah, machine-like way. And whether we care to admit it or not, you know, I think we're comfortable with this other thing being a part of our range as human beings, but more and more we're drawn into this other space as well. And uh, could relate it to our, our life and times now in, in any number of ways, whether it's, you know, becoming data points for the corporations and politicians or, or the idea that when we, kind of, when our, when our machines do break down is really the only reason or way in which we kind of become aware of the uh, more mechanical aspects of these bodies that we inhabit. And so in a way, I really think of this as, as all kind of uh, human music, but just kind of a, an expanded sense of that. And the video here is made in collaboration with a painter who's been a very good friend of mine for a decade now. Uh, she teaches at the University of Tennessee. And uh, the last time I hosted Network here at UArts, we actually had a kind of a physical installation suspended above a, a chamber ensemble. This was our next kind of iteration of that idea. The, the images that you see here were actually made live. These paintings exist, although on a scale of about three by four and a half or, or five uh, feet. And the idea was that it's coming true that we're going to be able to do the piece here and then on Monday night out at Haverford. Uh, so it's been wonderful to host Network again. Great to see you all here and to hear this music uh, in this space. It, it really is wonderful for chamber music. I hope you agree. Uh, and I'm excited to share with you Moonbeams and Satellites. Here we go.
Thank you. 